I hope your 2016 had closed out to suit you and your 2017 has begun in a good way. I hope you've had plenty to eat again. I hope you've had good company. And maybe your favorite team has already won. The Holy Family was not having a good point in their year in the scripture that we just heard. Times were as uncertain and as scary as they could be for Mary, Joseph, and the baby. We don't see much of Christ's childhood in our scripture. And the glimpses we do get of Christ after his birth only lead to us wishing we knew more. There is a child story, a, a beautiful legend, really. And as this tale goes, Joseph and Mary have set out on their desperate flight to safety in Egypt, as we heard just a few minutes ago in Matthew. Having been warned in a dream that Herod wished to do their baby Jesus harm, they took off to flee, to flee Bethlehem. And as the evening comes along the way, they are weary they see a cave and decide that they ought to go into the cave and find rest. And there inside the darkness and the coolness of the evening, a spider sees the baby lying in rest. And the spider intuits that this is a special child, that this child is destined for something great. And so the spider ponders what gifts he might have to give and finally decides to do the only thing that he knows how to do. The spider goes to the entrance of the cave and begins to weave a very thick and intricate web. And soon the entrance to the cave has had a blanket of web put across it. Now the cool, damp air will be knocked off of the child. Just after this, Herod's soldiers come along in pursuit of the Holy Family, having heard that they may have fled Bethlehem and gone this way. And just as they're about to burst into the cave, one of the soldiers sees the web across the entrance, having collected dew. And the soldier says, there can't be anybody in here. The web would have been broken. Let's go on and don't waste our time. And so there in the safety of that place, Mary, Joseph, and the baby found rest. And so this is supposed to be the reason why we put tinsel on our Christmas trees, to commemorate this humble act, this gift to the Christ child told about in this legend. What a beautiful picture that story paints, I think. I was looking at a different kind of picture just the other day and I could have stared at it for some time if I didn't need to get ready to speak to you this morning. It's a painting done by the artist Luke Olivier Merson that reflects on this Egyptian pilgrimage made by the family. Light, shadows, and detail combine here to make one fascinating image. The flight to Egypt with Mary and Joseph having grabbed the Christ child and made their way to safety. In fact, the same artist did two paintings. But the Merson painting I looked at is entitled Repose in Egypt. The scene is Egypt's famous Sphinx monument, and although not the focal point of the work, my eye eventually lands on Joseph. Lying several feet away, his gaze is set upwards. He is awake. Meanwhile, you can see there around him a donkey tethered and picking at the ground for any food that might be nearby. There is an object off to the side. It might be a saddle or a blanket that they have taken off of the donkey after a hurried trip that night. And of course, Mary holds the baby. She holds the baby Jesus in her arms between the mammoth paws of the lion. The face of the sphinx is lit by the glow of the child himself. Lots going on in the painting, but there's Joseph lying there staring at the baby and at his mother Mary. And I have to ask, what is Joseph thinking about? Is it fear? Wondering if they have truly escaped the peril that would have befallen them in Bethlehem? 
Have they traded danger for danger by crossing the border into this neighboring power? Could it be tiredness and confusion after just the suddenness of the trip? Now, at least for a time, they're granted some rest, but now, at least for a time, the reality is sinking in on him. Maybe Joseph is connecting with the beginnings of grief, for they have fled their homeland and right into the ironic sanctuary of Egypt, a place their people had famously left after generations of slavery there. One could even suppose that he's pondering an ongoing problem. In saying yes to God all those months ago, what has he really gotten himself into? So we have this curious, brief flight for the Holy Family. Their time in Egypt is only part of the mystery of the Christ. There's so much more we'd like to know. And in about 10 quick verses, this is what we have. Well, that and the whole of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life that paint in a little bit of the texture, but like Olivier, we are left ourselves to paint in the rest, the lessons that this story might hold for us. And if this brief story sketches the structural outline for us, then the life of Christ provides the palette of colors from which we can work. Now, scholars have long since discussed this story in Matthew. It raises so many questions, but let me run through some of the things that we do know. First of all, Herod was plenty capable of such scattered destruction as to murder babies in defense of his kingdom. Jesus must surely have been in legitimate danger. We also know that Bethlehem of Judea was only a few miles from the scrutiny of Bethlehem, or rather of Jerusalem. Bethlehem was a very small town, maybe only 1,500 people or so. It wasn't even on a major road. And depending on how you look at it, the family could have stayed there and blended in to all the nothingness. Or there might not be a lot of uh, fa families in the town with babies that young. And so they might have stood out had they chosen to stay. It, it feels like staying really wasn't an option. But Egypt, on the surface of it, seems like an odd place for these Jews to have sought refuge. Hadn't Pharaoh pursued them once upon a time? But in fact, there were cities all over Egypt with large numbers of Jewish people. The city of Alexandria is rumored to have had a million Jews at the time of Jesus' birth. People had escaped Canaan in incident after incident over the centuries of our Old Testament that made life back in Egypt more appealing. Now, this story, we also know, is not just mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. We find extra-biblical uh, uh, traditions that tell of Jesus being spirited off to Egypt by his parents and spending a portion of his childhood there. So today's text is just 10 verses. And in reality, there are three distinct movements within these short 10 verses, not even one homogenous story in some ways. But there are some lessons that I believe we can take away from having spent some time in this brief glimpse of Jesus' childhood. Some things that I think we might do to, well to, to take notice of and to take with us today. First of all, I'm struck that even the Son of God needed to take refuge. If the Holy Family had to run to Egypt for their very lives, how much more will I need to take refuge also from time to time? Maybe you too. Oh, we haven't faced the kind of physical challenge that they did, the kind of physical danger that was uh, at their back. And while our faith may draw a much colder reception in today's culture than it used to, I haven't been personally threatened yet for my faith, and probably you haven't either. No, for us, I think refuge and retreat may be needed for any number of other kinds of reasons. Refuge from bad advice. Ways of thinking that might lead us into, into danger or captivity. People who have our ear who ought not. Cultural patterns that may be in the majority but obviously don't fit in 
with what we believe to be the truth. Or we may need refuge from hopelessness that can absolutely paralyze us. There are a lot of people walking around who have already sunk into self-pity. They can't see enough positive ahead to work toward anything different than what they are in right now. And God in the Christmas Christ reminds us that creativity can come from limited possibilities and that newness can emerge from what once seemed barren and devoid of form. We may have to relocate or start new, but there's always hope. We may need to take refuge from skewed senses of normal in this new year. Consumer habits have shaped our expectations, our relationships, and our goals. So many people are bored these days, if we're being honest. Others have just come to live such provincial lives, shaped by their habits, their prejudices, their biases, their unchanged ways. And sometimes we, we need God to act in our lives as a reset button that clicks us away from our patterns. We may need refuge from ourselves, at least some dimensions of who we are. We're capable of coming up with our own poor ideas. It's not all our culture's fault. It's not all the fault of those around us. Sometimes we have our own poor ideas and the wants of our hearts leading us toward less healthy ways of living, thinking, or feeling. We need to be saved from ourselves at times. And God would be that place of refuge or perspective if we allowed it to happen. Still, some of us need a refuge from pain because while we may cause a lot of our own problems, some of them come our way through no fault of our own. And we need safe people and places that will promote healing, learning, and finding our way back. And don't let me miss at least one very positive reason for refuge, to recharge and grow to grow closer to God in retreat, to grow closer to our spouse or our family as we step away from the usual. The Gospels show Christ on retreat a lot. And by the way, I'm fascinated to find in the Old Testament that particularly the Psalms will point to God as that refuge. They do not say that God has provided a place of refuge. To these people who have believed and tested this faith before us, God is refuge. Many of them attest. If Jesus and his family needed retreat, I will too sometimes. And that's not only okay, it's pretty basic to being human, to being a person of faith. But also I'm drawn back to Joseph here. Because Joseph seems to be pondering in that painting that Olivier did. He seems to be just taking it all in. And life gives us a lot to think about. And so does our faith, if we'll let it. A lot to just ponder. We, we've just acknowledged Herod reacted by ordering the deaths of all the baby boys in that region, two years old and under. And we say, surely he wouldn't have. Oh, yes, he would have. And that's a lot to comprehend. This is a ruler who started his reign by annihilating members of his Sanhedrin. He is said to have slaughtered at least 300 court officers at one point. Later, he killed his own wife and three sons. And that's hard to relate to. That's a lot to think about. Joseph, just off to the side, making meaning of the whole thing. We need to only sit and listen to our family and friends about what's going on in their lives in order to know that life gives us a lot to think about. Hear the stories our co-workers tell about loss and challenge and tragedy. A sustained recession a few years back cast a level of fear and uncertainty whose taint will be left on our ways of thinking for a long time to come, long after any economic reality and recovery has hit you or has been documented for sure. Employees, you and me, will not feel as certain about our jobs and our places of employment as we once did. People will not trust institutions, companies, and organizations even as well as they did because they saw such widespread failure and collapse once upon a time. 
Now, on the upside, as we look back on this dramatic episode already, children's play in some quarters has harkened back to a simpler, lower tech set of games and activities for sure. In some homes, this has proven to be true. The supper table has made somewhat of a comeback as families have had to rethink meals and experiences. Values, meaning, and goals have been reevaluated in the aftermath of the recession because people have had to. Stories of personal heroism in the face of danger have come to herald the kind of personal hope that some of us occasionally notice balancing out some of the pain and evil. In Dayton, Ohio, a woman was driving down the street just as she saw a suspect attack a police officer. The suspect had gotten the upper hand on the officer and things were going badly. Armed only with her conviction and her strength of will, she stopped her car, got out and jumped on the back of the assailant and pounded on that man until she and the officer were able to subdue him. Stories like that, although possibly showing poor judgment, <laughs> inspire us to believe that there is still goodness in humanity and that there's still value in community. People have seemed in some places and in some ways to have regained sense of camaraderie and sharing because they have been forced to by worse times past. And at least some of us have noticed hope found in places like flash mobs that still occasionally pop up on, on social media. People who in a food court in a mall just burst out singing Handel's Messiah and the, so the sounds of Alleluia inspire those around them. And parents have begun to reconsider the legacy they'll hope to pass along to their children as smaller 401ks have made obvious the notion that monetary inheritance might not be the front page headline in their families they had once hoped. Something else more lasting will have to be passed along instead. Life gives us a lot to think about, doesn't it? And as we do that evaluation, that thinking, I hope our faith informs our reactions. I hope God shapes our next steps. In fact, as I look back on Joseph sitting there, it seems that in saying yes to God, like Joseph, we have also gotten ourselves into something for sure. And that ought to have our full attention, just as it seems to Joseph's in that painting. In the last segment of our text, there go Joseph and Mary again. This time they've been told that Herod has died and that they should return to the, their homeland of Israel. But Joseph knew that Herod's son, Archelaus, was now ruling. You heard that mentioned in the story. And he felt like Judea might still be a dangerous place to be. So they picked up and moved their holy child to the tiny area of Nazareth of Galilee. And we don't really know what scripture is in mind with the quote that you heard in verse 23. But the writer of Matthew's gospel seemed to faithful to God's challenging, maybe even inconvenient calling, Joseph and family moved. They moved into the uncertainty of being where God wanted them to be. Now, geography might not always be the where of God's calling for you or me. Maybe the where of God's calling might be to move closer to a relationship that needs our investment. It might be the move that God calls us to, into a place of service or along a path of spiritual growth might be the where of God's calling for you this new year, away from the harmful events of your life and into a place of refuge might be your call to move this year. 2017 might need to see you uh, uh, following God's call to reach out beyond yourself in giving, in teaching, in leading, or inviting. But rest assured, rest assured, when we respond yes to God's calling, we will get ourselves into something. But faithfulness seems to work out to be worth it in the end. 
Maybe it's because at least we are with God. We are where God wants us to be. This odd flight into Egypt isn't the only part of Christmas that we wish we knew more about. The miracles of the larger Christmas story also bring with them questions that we find ourselves pondering in the season. Bishop Julian Gordy, a Lutheran minister, summed up the mystery of Christ well, and I want you to hear these thoughts. He said, in Bethlehem of Judea, on the first Christmas, God came to us as a baby, spoke to us in a language we can all understand. In the story of a baby's first cry, a mother's protective love, a father's anxious standing by. For 2,000 years, we have been telling the story because it is the best we can do to explain the unexplainable to say thanks for something so fine as this baby who is evidence that God is with us, with the least of us, and with every last one of us. God is with the sick and the dying. God has not forgotten the refugees and the persecuted and the misunderstood. God is with us. God is with us in the dangerous city of Kandahar and in the refugee camp in Darfur and in the walled-off prison city of Bethlehem. God is with us right here when our marriages fall apart and when our children get in trouble. God is with us when our health fails, when age and disease whittle away at our stamina and our competence. God is with us. So we tell the story again, he says, until we can see God with us. We tell it until we can see God with the unwanted and forgotten of the world We tell the story until it is pressed into our conscience, until God becomes incarnate in us, and we begin, to some degree anyway, to become Christ to our neighbors. Incarnations of the good news that God loves the world. Rest will be found in the refuge of Jesus Rest will be found in the refuge of God. Peace is to be gained when we are where God wants us to be. Can you hear the call? There's not much I can promise you in life, really. But one thing I can say with certainty, God is calling you and me. Of that, I have no doubt beckoning us closer, making us get on the move sometimes. And the question is, are we listening like Mary and Joseph did? We're going to sing together a hymn of response. Hymn number 418, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. If in this new year you have a response that can be made where you are, do that. But if you have one that might draw you closer to the fellowship of this church, if you have one that our pastor needs to hear about, he's going to be standing right here at the front as we sing. Let's stand together. Hymn number 418.